the project we're going to be working on is this cute little chickadee. You can get this reference photo over at my website. This came from Unsplash. I'm going to be doing a watercolor underpainting and colored pencil on top. One of my favorite mixed medias because these two play so nicely together. Colored pencil sticks so well on top of, of watercolor. So one of the things you're going to see much different on my project versus what the reference photo has is on this guy, I'm going to make my background a lot lighter. I'm going to do a light wash. I'm not going quite as dark brown as what the reference photo has. I want to make the bird like I just don't think I want it that dark. So that is the plan. You can see I've got my watercolor pans over here and I'm just gonna do a light wash of a tan color. So what I like to do, let's now watercolor, to be fair, it works better when you're working flat the way that it spreads, everything's good. I, because of my back, am quite limited. I have to stay upright, keep my neck upright. So I work at an easel, which definitely makes things a bit more challenging. If you're able to work flat, it's going to be easier. And I'm, I drew this on with a regular graphite pencil so that when I do the wash over it, I can go right over the bird. The graphite is going to stay there. I'm just going to use a larger wash brush. This one is a number one filbert. This one is the Mimic Creative Mark. I don't even know what color I want to use here. I don't think that one. Which one? Are you black? You might be black. Actually, you will work. And I'm just going to thin that out. Let's get a little bit more of the brown. I need it a little bit thicker than that. With watercolor, well, this would be the same with acrylics or other mediums. The more water you add, the more translucent it's going to be. And in this case, being more translucent is going to let more of that white show through. So that's how I'm getting it light. I'm not going to mix white to lighten it up like I might with acrylics. So that is definitely going to be a difference here. I need a lot more than what I'm mixing. There we go. Okay, and I'm, I'm actually going to test that. So I have a scrap piece of paper and I definitely recommend this. Have a scrap piece of the same type of paper that you're painting on because I can test it on this. You know, I think I'd like a little bit more of a reddish brown color in there. I'm glad I tested it here. For, oh, that color is accurate on the camera. I'm glad I tested it here instead of on my work. So I'm going to pull just a little bit of like a, it's either a burnt sienna or a red oxide. I'm not sure which, but something along those lines. Let's pull some of that in here. Add a little bit more water. Let's test that. Much better. I'm just going to wash that right over everything. Need more water. See how, because I'm working upright, it can start to run, which is unfortunate. You don't want drips. If you're working flat, not a problem. And I'm going right over the bird because none of that really matters here. It's just a base layer. Now, if I was going to do this just with watercolor, I would put likely if I wanted to do like this messy of a background, just painting over everything and not painting around anything, I would then use a masking fluid to mask off the bird so that I don't get the paint on it. But because of what I'm doing here, it's fine. And if I want to fan that out, I can actually just grab my brush that I use with acrylics, mop brush. I'm going to soften that up. Add a little bit more water here. I just use my fine mist sprayer so that I can soften that out, keep it wet long enough to blend all of that out. Anyone who is like really proficient with watercolor is probably cringing because this is not a normal way to work. But like I said, because I'm working upright at an easel, I am somewhat limited on how this is going to work for me. Now, one of the things I love, and it was frustrating for me when I first started getting used to watercolor, but as I've gotten used to it, I actually really like it. One of the things that I'm loving with watercolor is that I can lift things up. So let's say I had a brush stroke that I'm like, oh, I just don't like that, the paint ran, whatever. If I don't like it for any reason, you can rework it. You can re-wet it and soften it out. So that's about it for the, the background. I want that background just to be a very pale, very light brown. And I'm gonna dry that. Now what I've done too, one of the things I did not mention, I used an acid free, it's a pH neutral tape, it's a masking tape to tape this down. So as you're painting and the paper starts to warp, I can just take the hair dryer, tightens back up, it's all nice and flat, so we're good there. Let's get a smaller brush. Yeah, there's a stack of them over here. Let's see, who wants to do this? Probably this one. So this one is another of the 
Creative Mark, the Mimic brush that I'm gonna use. Let's get some of that black. I'm not gonna go with flat black. I'm gonna get a bit of, so I'm mixing in a bit of purples and magentas, just pulling some of that so that it's not just a flat black. Actually, I think more reds would be better than purples. Nope, I don't like that one as much. There we go. The point is I don't just want straight black. Okay, so we've got the little eye. Are we zoomed in enough? So we've got this ring. I'm just gonna use a really light hand. Now, if you like tiny detail, that's one of the things like watercolor, look how, look, look, that is the tiniest little line and it is so easy to do with watercolor. I'm not gonna worry about the shine on the eye because I can do that with colored pencil. these little details. I would actually think, watercolor I think is easier to get the tiny details than pretty much any other medium I work in. So you wanna watch the direction of the feathers as we move through here. And nothing needs to be perfect because we remember, we're gonna come on top of this with colored pencil in this case. I'm going, I'll just use this for right now to rest my hand because I'll be moving and round enough that the glassine would actually be a bit annoying to put under my hand because I would have to keep moving it. But look at these little feathers. Like if you really like realism where there's just tiny, tiny, tiny detail, my gosh, give watercolor a try. Now watercolor is one of those mediums that I think is more dependent on good like quality supplies all around than pretty much anything else. Like with acrylics, I, acrylics and oils, I use a lot of generic paintbrushes, no problem. Watercolor, oh my gosh, the brushes you use makes a huge difference. And one of the channels, if you are really looking to go further with watercolor, check out Mind of Watercolor. He has got some amazing videos, really knows what he's doing, great teacher. He's here on YouTube. But with this, and he's gonna give you way more information because I, I mean, when I use, watercolor myself. I'm generally using it with mixed media. I like it with colored pencil, but he does like straight watercolor and you can learn a whole lot with that. And the reason that I don't want to start with black, if I start with my darkest dark, I can't go darker. Here I can go light, lighter or darker. This is more of a mid range and I will pull more dark black even with the watercolor, just not yet. You can always very, very easily make something darker. It is a lot more difficult to lighten it up. Now, because I am gonna go over it with water or with colored pencil, that certainly removes a lot of the pressure. And that's one of the things too, if you've tried watercolor in the past and you thought, oh, it's too hard, it just makes a mess. If you do it as an underpainting, it is not nearly as complicated because you can fix a lot I don't want to say cheating because you can't really cheat with art and well besides stealing someone's reference photo that's but that's more theft than cheating uh, but I mean any method works but it it really does make it easier when you know that you can fix stuff with your colored pencils later on they look at those feathers like that is and it's so easy to do so we've got our beak and the harder you push, the thicker that line will be. And this one, it is a number six round of the creative mark. It gets tiny little details so well. We've got the bottom. for the feathers under this and you can watch the direction of the feathers. You don't need it to be exact, but you do want these to be fairly close. You don't want to just be putting random lines everywhere. Really watch the way they clump and cluster together in which direction they're moving in. Now this is going to achieve much more realistic results. One of the problems that a lot of people have when drawing birds or animals, anything fur or feathers, or even people hair, they will make just the random lines all over. This is weird confetti. This is not looking like anything. This is controlled, very controlled. Slow down and take your time. There is no rush here. Well, maybe a little bit for me because it's a live stream, but for you guys, there is no rush.
you can see where I pushed harder and I've also got more water on the brush was more heavily loaded. That's where I get those heavier brush strokes. And then lighter pressure here. Now you often hear me say with glassine, I like it better than using a piece of paper because a piece of paper you can smudge if you get like a little bit of colored pencil under. I don't have colored pencil out right now, so it's not even a problem. So just using a clean piece of paper to keep the oils of my skin off the work is enough. You do not want the oils of your skin on your work because people juices are not archival, as it turns out. So we, we spend the money to use light fast and archival pH neutral paper, light fast paints. We're, we're putting all that effort in, effort in. Don't ruin it by getting your people juice hand, hand juice all over your work. Even when your hands are clean, my, like my hands are clean and dry, but it's still not good for the, the paper, for the longevity. I still need to make that into a t-shirt. People juice is not archival. Although a lot of people would misunderstand that. You guys will know what it is. And if this paint starts to dry here, all I need to do is add more water, it'll reactivate. See these little wisps, watch how they overlap. And see again, we've got that mid-range tone. I can definitely very easily come back in and add darker colors on this now. This color is great too for where the whites will go. And I can just barely see my graphite pencil lines. I used a 3H pencil to draw this initial um, line drawing out. Watch how these curve. Right now he looks like he's like super spooked. We'll fix that as we move on. Don't be afraid, little chicken. I'm just gonna keep it easy by mapping everything out with the one color right now, which actually looks cool. You can leave something with just these two colors. It gives you that sort of antique -y look. I like it. Now the other thing, if you are used to working with oil and acrylic brushes, I don't know about you, but I am really hard on those brushes like the scrubbing techniques, like there's so many things I do. When you're working with watercolor brushes, they are more expensive because you're using higher, if, like what I was saying before, they're more dependent on higher quality. Um, don't scrub these, don't leave them in your water. I talk about that all the time. Never just leave your, ever, like not even for a second. Do not leave your brush sitting in water. water. It will damage the, those bristles so fast and you are not gonna be a happy camper. This is so fun. Like it's just so satisfying doing these little details. Look how thin those lines are. I'm gonna pull some of these feathers in from the back of the head here. Remember, we'll be coming back through with white, so it's not gonna stay this dark. but I'm gonna be using the white colored pencil, not white, um, the white watercolor. I do have white watercolor, but that's not how I'm gonna get the white in with this guy. This is another thing. The feathers don't need to be exact, but do make sure they go in the right direction. Go for close. He's already super cute.
Okay. We've got a lot of little feathers through here. I'm going to go ahead and put those in now, even though a lot of this will be coming on top with a colored pencil. But these lines, I can get thinner lines with this watercolor and this brush than I could ever get with that colored pencil. Like with colored pencil, if I want that thin of a line, I'm generally going to work a little bit larger. As we get over, we've got the leg here. Let me map some of that out. So here's his little leg. And then we've got feathers that move this way. So I don't have the lines here, so we just go for close. I may do a really detailed, like an owl or some kind of bird in watercolor uh, lesson coming up here soon on Patreon because these thin lines are just so satisfying. Maybe that's what I'll do this week because I don't have a project yet for this week. These little lines are so fun, but you've got to have the right brush. That's a must. And it doesn't have to be this specific brush. There's plenty of brushes that do it, but you have to have a good, healthy brush. You don't want one that's been damaged. He's so cute and floofy. His feet are kind of a mess over there. I'll come back to that in a moment. They're really weird, weirdly positioned. Like here, let's see, we've got a toe. It's drawn out, but I can't really see it very well. That is the middle toe goes out. And this toe curves around. And we've got the nail. over here with a nail and then the toenail under there comes out and this looks weird right now until I get the shading and this will really be just mostly very dark then this foot's kind of an odd position as well is that on camera they're getting close I should probably move this down a bit For those of you who are members over on Patreon, if you've got a specific type of bird you would like me to see me do in watercolor for this week's lesson, let me know. I'll see what I can find. Chances are with birds, somebody's got a reference photo over on wildlifereferencephotos.com, so I can more often than not find just about anything. Not everything, but most things. Or maybe one of, I don't know what I had for the reference photos this month. little feathers on his chest here. Now I want to get anything where I want the darks in there with watercolor. Anything with watercolor I want done before I start with colored pencil. Once I start with colored pencil, that's it. We're not going to be going back over anything with watercolor. So this medium, these are compatible, but it needs to be watercolor first because it's a water-based me medium. You don't want to put a water-based medium on top of a wax or oil base, which is what colored pencil is. So you're not going to do that now. You could put down colored pencil and it basically makes a wax protection. So when you watercolor it around the colored pencil, like the watercolor doesn't stick to it. It'll just wipe right off. So there's some cool things you can do with that, but don't plan on putting watercolor on top and having it stay permanently. It's not going to. And look when I put these little feathers, they're more clumped together. They're not, I'm not going to try to put every little feather in there. If you paint this along with me, whether it be now or in the future, please tag me on social media. I would love to see how yours comes out. That's so always so fun. I 
make sure these group together, not a bunch of individual little worms. Okay, let's get the branch and then we'll do a little bit more with the values and then we can start on colored pencil. And we've got these little buds starting to form on the branches, so we'll sketch those in. Seems kind of perfect for this time of year. I know that's what my crepe myrtles look like right now. They have these little buds for forming for the leaves. Let's see, we've got a little bud right about here. Okay, and I need kind of a gold. So I'm going to mix a little bit of the yellow ochre with some raw sienna. Let's see how that comes out. I'm going to put a little bit of magenta, pull some of that in there too. Yeah, I like that color better. A little bit softer. Let's see how that looks on the paper. Yeah, I like that. So we're gonna do right in here, just a little. So I'm gonna put the lighter colors with colored pencil. So I do wanna get a little bit more of this rich tone in here. Okay, now let's go ahead and get some of that definite black, the definite darks. Actually, I need to do his eye too, which is just a dark brown. Not that color. What I should do, I don't have my, oh, they're down there. That's why. There we go, here's a brown. I don't have my color swatches out, which I should do, and I'll show you in a second what Um, what I recommend everybody do for your watercolors. A link to the color swatch you can download to make your own color swatches on my website. So this is my color chart and that lets me know exactly what is in my palettes over there because they this gets very confusing to remember which one was brown. Like I was grabbing this one when really this is what I wanted. If I had just grabbed my chart here, that would have made it a little bit easier instead of having to test on my scratch piece of paper. So these are really handy to make and I'll put a link on my video uh, or my uh, website where you can download a blank one and make it to match your palette. Next, we've got some of the black. We'll get some of those darker colors. And remember, whatever you're doing, don't stress yourself out too much about finding the perfect color. If you're gonna stress yourself out, stress over the perfect values. Get your darks dark enough, your lights light enough. This is what's really gonna make all the difference in your, the world in your work looking more realistic, assuming that's your goal. Which, if you're watching this video, or one of my videos, I'm assuming that's where you're going with that. But you want to make sure your darks are dark enough, your lights are light enough. This is what will control the work looking realistic. The perfect color isn't gonna make that big of a difference. I mean, it helps. It, you, the more accurate you are in anything, the better, of course. But it, let's say I painted all of him with purple. He would just look like he was under purple lighting, but he would still look realistic as long as my values are correct. I stuck my finger in that just to tone all that down a bit. But everyone often gets so hung up about which color I'm using. Don't, if it looks green, I mean, close is close enough on something like that. Is it dark enough? 
Is it light enough? That's what's going to make the difference. When you can stop fussing over, like really worrying about the exact color, you're gonna see your work jump leaps and bounds because you started focusing on the right thing. One of the reasons a lot of people don't improve very fast is they're focusing on the wrong thing. They're blaming the problems in their work on the wrong thing, like color, or I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. There's some, some big ones that people will think is the problem and it's like it has nothing to do with that. If I only put the paint on thicker, okay, that probably wasn't the problem. My mom is texting me the bird she wants me to draw. She wants me to paint him a lock and cockatoo. I don't know if that's gonna be this week's. That would be good for pan pastels because they're so soft, the light colors. That would be more of a pan pastel colored pencil, which I could do, not for this week, but that may be an upcoming project. Or an acrylic painting with airbrushing. Okay, I've got ideas for the Moroccan. Okay, that is, my mom is watching right now. That is happening soon, but not this week because I don't think that's the, the I think watercolor, there's other birds that with the little details, what I'm going for, where Moroccans have that softer look so that that would be a different medium I would choose. Not that it couldn't be done in watercolor, but I'm looking for something with this level of teeny, teeny, tiny detail. Plus, if I paint a Moroccan, my mom is just going to claim it for herself. I know how this works. Canary could be good. A um, oh, what are those finches? The super, uh, the Lady Goldian finches. Those would be really cool. When you get into these little feathers that are super tiny and they're aimed at the viewer, little dots are all you need. Now see here, we've got two tones. We've got some medium highlights and we've got the darkest darks. That's why we didn't want to just go straight black here. Also notice as we get into this, look how it's almost in rows. Now not straight lines, but look how they clump together there. If you have not seen what a Lady Goldie and Finch looks like, you probably have, you just didn't know the name. Go look that up. So pretty. I would get some, but I have enough critters to take care of. Okay, let's get down into these darker areas. Now this is a little globby with the black, so what I can do, let's rinse my brush, actually rinse in the right one, and just with water now, I can smudge that out, even spread that. It reactivates, so even if it started to dry, it doesn't matter, it'll reactivate, and you can smudge that around. Okay, a little bit more with the dark, then we'll do the branch and switch over to colored pencil. This brush, yeah, this brush smells terrible, by the way. Works great, does not smell pretty. Loof stick out a little bit further in a couple of these spots. A little bit off the dark. I'm not trying to cover up all of the previous dark areas I did on the feet, just making a few areas a bit darker. Okay, 
Okay, we need to get the tone of the branch in there. More of that reddish brown with some purple. I'm making a mess. People who watercolor regularly are cringing right now at how I'm mixing my watercolor and just going on top all messy. And we're just going to go right over that. And while I get my colored pencils out, the boys can share their message. Without treats, these puppies are so sad. Your Patreon pledge of only $4 or more gives them cookies of happiness. Act now and the bad cow gets a treat too. Oh, and you also get over 300 art lessons and a new one every single week, plus other rewards. Sign up at patreon.com slash lockery. So just have a random stack of pencils. I just grab colors that look like they would probably work okay for me. And I'm going to start with black and white. Those are really the two main colors I'm going to be focusing on here. Let's see how well that shows up. Pretty good, okay. And I do want to grab now some glassine because now I'm not going to be jumping around quite as much. So I will stick this on here. And let's get started. I'm going to start around his eye. And I'm going to put that little highlight in now too. Look how well that sticks. That shows up so good. That makes me happy. And then here, the white will show up. And if the, the brown I'd put before was darker, the white would show up even more. Like it would be more of a contrast. Actually, let me switch. I wanna grab, there's a white. Where's my Derwent? light fast or Derwent, Derwent drawing white on some of this I think would be really good. Now remember white is not all like straight white. White is almost never white. You're going to save your brightest white for the brightest highlights. You're not trying to make this all solid white. There's a row right in here that's really light. So I'm going to come through here and push pretty hard and burnishing at this point because that's really light. But the rest of it isn't that light. We've got a few strands. That's a problem a lot of people run into. Let's say they're painting a white cat or a white fox, something like that. Like, how do you paint that? It's just white. It's not. Really look at it. Use a color matching tool on a photo app. You will see it's usually like a blue or a purple. It's gray. It's not, there's not that much straight white in anything. Now, if I burnish, I'm pushing really hard. I don't need to blend that out with OMS in order to make it look really soft. It'll just be soft because of how hard I'm pushing. And on this guy with that detail, that is the plan. Okay, let's see if I need... See if this gray will work. This may not be the right gray because it's a warm gray. Actually, on this piece, that probably would work. Yep. So I'm taking a warm gray. This is a polychromo, so it's, it gets to a super sharp point. I've got that shadow back here. I can even pull a little bit of blue in there too if I want. So I think I'm gonna keep this with the warmer tones. Now this line, this shadow, look how it connects. This rounds off, they meet that highlight and this shadow.
Same thing here. We've got another line, a darker shadow here, and it connects. So that's the thing you want to watch on a lot of your pieces. Look at where things line up. That lines up with this. This one here lines up with that highlight. Look at your reference photo. Really look at your reference photo. I don't mean just glance at it. Look closely at it for things like that. That's how you're going to check your work against itself to make sure that it's accurate. Highlight out here. Go a little bit harder and make that really stand out. Now, if you've got touch up texture, titanium white mixture from brushandpencil.com, you can also use that if you wanted to get your highlights even brighter. That would be an option as well. Okay, let's get some black in here. We've got those really dark areas. A little bit darker on the top of the beak there. And I'm gonna go right over that line too. I don't want it that bright. Look how easy it is to get all this tiny detail with this mixture of watercolor and colored pencil. And it doesn't take that long either. You just have to really pay attention to the direction. Now, it, let's say you're going slow. I know I said it doesn't take long, but if you are finding it just taking you a long time, that will speed up with time. The more you do this and really get a feel for how these feathers should go, you'll get to where you can go through these pretty quickly. But that does, that may take years to get really comfortable with it. So if right now you're like, what is she talking about? This takes me forever. That's okay. That doesn't mean you're not doing a great job. It's just one of those things that, that you will pick up speed as time goes on naturally. You don't have to try. It's just going to happen on its own. Let's pull some more gray back here. Okay, I'm gonna define this area. See right now it's just kind of scraggly, like I don't have a definite, where does the white and the black start and stop? Let's break that up a bit better now. Like some of this in here is a mixture of, of that salt and pepper look between the two, but we definitely wanna see that that is dark right under his neck here. Don't fill it in all the way. I want those light areas we did before to show too. Okay, let's move this over. Work on that wing a bit. So we've got a decent amount of gray back here. I'm giving it a decent amount of pressure because I don't want to have to burnish or not burnish. I am burnishing. That is what I'm doing so that I don't have to blend with OMS later. It looks super smooth because I'm pushing harder. But remember, when you push harder like that, that's going to limit how many lemon? No, not lemon. Limit how many uh, layers you can get on top. If you push really hard, you flatten the tooth of the paper. You're jamming that pencil in there. That's why it looks so smooth. But that also means you flatten the tooth of the paper so future layers won't stick super well. So you've got to balance when you can push hard versus where you want to use a lighter hand. Okay, and as we get down here, we've got that gray. And I'm gonna to switch to a polychromous white because it's not gonna be as opaque. It's just gonna lighten in with that gray. So it gives me this really good soft blend. Whereas if I had used a more opaque white, like the Derwent Drawing or the Derwent Light Fast or Caran d'Ache Luminance, any of those more opaque ones, then this would be too bold, too white. I just want it to, to blend in with that gray and lighten it a bit. bit more in here. I'm going to 
burnish over that again. And I'm gonna define this a bit more with the gray, with my lines, because I lost some of those. Okay, now we are going to move over and start working on his chest in this area. Slide my glassine out of the way. And all the supplies I'm using, listed in the video description, if I did my job right, which is questionable. Let's see which white I like better. For Probably still the Derwent Light Fast because it's a thicker let. Yeah, it's gonna give me a bit of a softer look with it being thicker and softer here. Now this is another area, we've got a lot of white, so I'm pushing pretty hard, going pretty solid, but you can still see a lot of these dark areas that I did earlier. We don't wanna cover those completely. I do wanna sharpen this pencil though. Now remember with these, notice that this is not a super sharp point, whereas, let me find, look at the difference in how these are sharpened. This is a much shorter point because this, this lead is so much more brittle than an oil-based pencil. This is the Derwent drawing. It's a very soft lead. It's a very opaque lead, which is amazing, but you don't want to sharpen it as long of a point as you would, say, the polychromos, which is a harder lead. Still watching the direction of those feathers. Look at that reference photo. You should spend more time looking at your reference photo than you do your artwork. This isn't something where you just glance at it once and you've got it. And that's a mistake I see students make a lot is they put that reference photo, it's right next to where they're, look, they're working, but they're not, you, they're not looking at it. So one of the things I used to do is time students you're gonna look at this for 60 seconds, and if that didn't work, we're gonna up it to two minutes. Just stare, study every little detail. You really want to observe what is in that photo. The photo is telling you what to draw. So if you, you're sitting there feeling lost, you, you're not spending enough time looking at that photo. It's got the answers for you. Like it's your cheat sheet. It gives you everything, and I don't say cheat because I know somebody's gonna mistake that and go, oh, if you're using a reference photo, you're cheating. No, that's not a thing. That is all artists who work in realism or photorealism where are using photos or live models. That's how that goes. So those who think that you work from your memory, if that makes you a better artist. No, it means you're probably producing crap is what that means. But the, the, the idea of a cheat sheet like math, you've got a cheat sheet, you've got your answers there. Your photo has the answers. You just have to learn to pay attention to it and observe what is there. One of the things I like to do too, when you hear these weird tips that people give you, they're like, you know, don't use a reference photo or just random stuff. I had a guy the other day arguing with me about you can't use water, don't, don't use more than 30% water mixed into your acrylic paints. So this is actually a good little thing. Um, I'll take a break from this for just a moment because I do want to talk about this. You will have people who tell you things like that. Again, the don't use 30%. He's, he was being kind of a, a jerk about it, telling me, good luck, you're going to need it. Dude, I've been a professional artist for nearly 30 years. If that was going to be a problem for me, I probably would have had it happen at least once by now. Using water with your acrylics does not cause issues. But the point of me, me talking about this guy is it's very common. You have that, you'll have people who will say, don't, um, don't use a reference photo. Your work is better if you don't use a reference photo. When you see stuff like that, go look at their art. Usually they don't even show their art. But when they do, you look and you're like, Dude, your work is terrible. Why would I listen to anything you have to say? You're gonna have that a lot where you get really questionable advice. Go look up their art. It is not what you want yours to look like in pretty much any case. Like, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where somebody was giving that really bad, like just misinformation advice about art and their work was any good. There's a reason they're giving you bad information. If something sounds questionable, like don't use a reference photo, don't use an eraser, that's one of my favorite ones, never erase anything. What are you talking about? You're just making up random rules. Like why? It's art, there are, there are no rules with that. So when you, whenever that happens and somebody's giving you that advice, just go look at what they're painting because it's probably not someone you want to bother listening to because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, back to work, sharpen the pencil.
Okay, so now right now, see, now right now, <laughs> grammar is my forte. See how flat everything looks. I'm gonna start pulling in. This is a mid ultramarine. I'm gonna pull in, oh, perfect. This is exactly what I want. A little bit of this shading with this blue. So any sort of light blue. And we're gonna start forming shadows in here. Remember, it's not about the color, it's about your values. This needed to be darker. It needed some sort of a shadow and I just love how this blue, my gosh, that is pretty. That adds so much to this. Oh, we're pulling that up here for sure for his highlight. I'm gonna pull some shadow, I'm all excited now. I'm gonna pull some shadows up here. That looks so good. Let's darken that so that the blue shows up better. It looks like a highlight instead of just the blue line. So that is actually, here's a good place to look at. My values are not correct here. I'm way too light. So let's darken that up. Let's pull some darks in there. I don't want to cover it completely. I want to see some of those lights, but I don't want it to look like it's white feathers. And that's what it looks like right now. Much better. Okay. Anywhere where I've got that shadow. Oh, it doesn't look that blue on yours. This looks way better in person than what it's picking up on camera. It almost looks too warm. Let me adjust this just a bit. I need to cool this off so it's a little bit. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, that looks good. Got a little bit of this blue in here. This is the Derwent Light Fast what did I say? Mid ultramarine. Pulling that over the grays. Okay, let's come down to his little feet. Little scaly toes. Okay, I need, let's see if this actually, nope, this color looks good. This is the Burnt Ochre Polychromos. Perfect, it gives me that nice gold tone in here right under that wing. And let's say I used more of a reddish brown instead of this. It would still look fine. You just need anything to darken this up and give you that warmer tone. If you don't have this exact pencil, you're still good. Do a little bit of this coloring up here. We didn't do that much with the watercolor, but look how much easier that like pushed us through on this project. Much faster than if I did it just in colored pencil. I'm gonna take a little bit of this Merlot. So it's kind of a, a reddish magenta color. Pull this for some of these shadows. I wanna define that a bit more than what my reference photo has. We'll be do definitely using this color with the branches too. Okay, I'm gonna use that same Merlot for my shadow, my darker area, because I don't wanna go super dark. Like black would be too dark. This will work. We've got the little bud. I am gonna need a lighter, oh, luckily I have one out. So this is strawberry, that oh, should work. Yep, that'll work. We've got that lighter color on the inside of these buds. I say buds. Well, I guess they would still be buds. I think they're leaf buds, not flower buds. I could be wrong. Just making stuff up. If it was a crepe myrtle, it would be a leaf bud. Can you tell I'm a bit obsessed with my crepe myrtles right now? Now, 
Now notice when you do a branch, see how it's not just highlight all the way on one side, shadow all the way on the other, it skips. So it's like, I've got a shadow here. I'm gonna have a highlight here. You've got a lot of variation there. Look at your photo. Don't just make an assumption when you see a branch, shadow on one side, highlight on the other, because trees, you've got shadows from other branches that will just cut across the middle of the branch that make no sense as far as this is the side for the shadow, this is the side for the highlight. Really look at that photo. Like I said, it's your cheat sheet. It's got all the answers. Now it's not cheating to use a photo. That's not gonna be my best example, is it? So you've got a shadow by this foot, another shadow by this foot. The glassine is falling over. I'm gonna take some of that golden color and burnish over the same color I used in the bird. So one of the things in your art, you can use the same colors in different areas. It will pull everything together really nicely instead of grabbing a different color all for everything that you're doing. If you can mix it with what you've already used, it will look more unified. I'm gonna take my polychromous white because I don't want it super white. We've got a little bit of a highlight there. bits of that kind of scribbling up. A few little shadows with the black in those buds. Just about done with this guy. Gonna take, let's see, a little bit darker. This one is red violet. It when I push with it or push hard, it gives me a softer, a smoother look for burnishing than I'm getting with the Derwent Light Fast. So I'll just go over that in a few spots. Okay, now it's really just adjusting little values here and there, like little details. I can see in this area by his wing, we've got a lot more with the dark feathers. So let's get some of these in here. Actually, the white needs to come down further too, though. So pull a few bits with the white. really hard anywhere where I want it to be really light. So if I make this darker, it makes what's next to it lighter. Right now it's a little bit too mid-range, so darken this guy up. using that same red violet that I used on the branch. Again, we want to pull the same color. If I used it in another area, I want to make sure it's on all the, you know, both the subject and the branch. There we go. I think he's about done. Actually, I like how much darker this red violet adds to the blue in here. Okay, now when you sign your work, you want to make sure that you account for where that mat is going to hit. So let me pull out the mat that would come with this guy. 
and he's going to fit just like that. Like that. Okay, so what I want to do then is take my, where do I want to sign this? Probably here. And this is important because if I had signed down here, thinking, okay, that's the bottom of the piece, that's going to get chopped off. I want to make sure that signature will fit within the mat. So even if you're not matting your work, make sure you're allowing for whatever mat size would fit to not chop off that signature. Hey, you. Yes, you. I see all your unused art supplies over there. Oh my God, those brushes aren't even opened yet. Tragic. You keep buying new fancy materials, but you don't use them because you don't want to waste them. Stop making your art supplies sad. Sign up for art lessons for as little as $4 a month. There are over 300 painting and drawing lessons available when you sign up and new ones every week. Patreon.com slash Lockery.